In some respects, the history of escape rooms is straightforward. The first was created by Takao Kato and opened in Kyoto, Japan in 2007. Kato's real escape game was advertised in a small classifieds paper and quickly sold out. Of the roughly 150 participants, only six people managed to escape. Kato later said that in creating his real escape game, he wanted to make a live action version of the Escape the Room video games that were popular in the mid 2000s. From that point forward, escape rooms began popping up across Japan and other Asian countries. Eventually, they gained a foothold in European cities, with the first European escape room opening in Budapest in 2011. The following year, escape rooms began to open in North American cities, like San Francisco, Seattle, New York, and Nashville. Today, escape rooms can be found in every major U.S. city, and even in some small towns and suburbs. But in many respects, the history of escape rooms is more complicated. You see, escape rooms were not simply invented by any one individual. In fact, many escape room developers claim to have created their escape rooms without knowing that other rooms already existed. For example, Atala Georkovich, who opened Europe's first escape room in Budapest, claims to have had no knowledge of Asian escape rooms and said that he came up with the idea on his own. Similarly, there are escape room-like experiences, such as True Dungeon and Five Wits, that predate Japanese escape rooms by several years. In his 2016 paper, Emergence or Convergence, Exploring the Precursors of Escape Room Design, Dr. Scott Nicholson, professor of game design and development at Wilfrid Laurier University, suggests that escape rooms are a convergence of other forms of gaming and media. In his 2015 survey of escape room owners, Dr. Nicholson found that escape room proprietors have been inspired by a wide range of media and interactive experiences. This video was heavily informed by Dr. Nicholson's research, and there are links to his publications in the description if you'd like to learn more. It seems that escape rooms emerged during a zeitgeist in gaming and entertainment, one that sought to engage all of the player's senses and plop them in the middle of a live-action adventure. The zeitgeist seems to have inspired some parallel thinking amongst creators of immersive, in-person experiences, including escape room owners. So instead of trying to suss out who opened which escape room first, in this video, we're going to talk about the intellectual history of escape rooms. The games, media, and interactive experiences that have had the most influence on this relatively new entertainment genre. Please note that this history will be American-centric, as that is where I live and English is the only language I speak fluently. But do remember that from 2007 to 2011, escape rooms were the sole province of Asia, and especially Japan. I tried to find information on escape room influences from Japanese and other Asian cultures, but given the language barrier, this proved too difficult to report on with any justice. Therefore, this video is primarily a Western history of escape rooms. These days, I'm often asked, how did you come up with the idea of the real escape game? I can't say anything really cool. I just answer like this. I was thinking about doing some kind of new event, and the girl sitting next to me said she was hooked on online escape games, so I just tried to make one. The first influence we'll look at is video gaming, as Takao Kato explicitly cites this as one of his escape room inspirations. The most well-known Escape the Room video game in the Western world is The Room, a mobile game series that debuted in 2012. In this game, the player moves through the rooms of a house and solves puzzles to uncover pieces of a story. The Room was a huge success, spurring three sequels and selling more than 12 million copies between all of its titles. And while this may be the most well-known Escape the Room video game, it is far from the first. The history of Escape the Room video games starts with the world's first point-and-click adventure game, Planet Mephius, which was released in Japan in 1983. Point-and-click adventure games allow players to control their character through a point-and-click interface, usually using a mouse. 
the player clicks to move their character around, interact with non-playable characters, and examine objects. Actions that are now central to Escape the Room gameplay. This may all sound fairly obvious and underwhelming to contemporary audiences, but Point and Click was a massive innovation when you consider that before Planet Mephius, virtually all computer games were text-based. To the modern eye, a text-based computer game looks more like a choose-your-own-adventure book than a video game. The player reads walls of texts and enters commands on their keyboard to advance the story. One such game was John Wilson's 1988 Behind Closed Doors, which was the first video game to introduce the concept of being locked in a single room. The room? An outhouse. Players had only a pencil stub, a newspaper, and their own wits to help them escape a bathroom. But keep in mind that the only way to use the items in this game was to manually type the words use pencil stub or use newspaper. Point-and-click adventure games like Planet Mephius allowed for a much higher degree of immersion and interactivity. Ten years after the release of Planet Mephius, another computer game would set a new standard for immersion and interactivity. This game is one that many of us know, whether we played it or not. In fact, it's a game that many people cite as one of their personal escape room influences. Nineteen ninety three's Mist. Created by brothers Rand and Robin Miller, Mist was a cultural phenomenon and a point of no return for point and click adventure games. Its impact on puzzle games is apparent to this day. If you were conscious in 1993, you probably played it, saw someone else play it, or at least saw it on the shelves at your local computer store. Mist's environments were eerie and immersive. A big upgrade from a text-based outhouse, Mist offered players five worlds to explore, each with their own soundtracks, theming, and aesthetics. Players were turned loose to explore their worlds with very few guardrails. Some people even refer to escape rooms as real-life Mist, and there are substantial parallels between the two. Mist locks you in to whichever book world you've entered. You can't return to the home world or progress to another book world until you've completed the one that you're in. Whether or not you liked this feature of the game, it does bear resemblance to contemporary escape rooms. Mist creators Rand and Robin Miller have said that they wanted to create non-arbitrary puzzles. That is, they strove to create puzzles that made sense in the logic, theming, and look of the world. And while the Millers have admitted that they were not always successful in this regard, their instinct was the right one. While many escape rooms are riddled with arbitrary puzzles, high-quality, well-designed escape rooms tend to have little to none. Myst had a massive impact on video gaming, and it set the stage and standards for point-and-click puzzle games by featuring narrative-driven puzzles, a high degree of interactivity between the player and their environment, and an unprecedented sense of immersion, thanks to its pre-rendered graphics and haunting soundtrack. The online Adobe Flash game Mystery of Time and Space, or MOTUS, is another seminal title in the Escape the Room genre. Created by Jan Albardus and released in 2001, with updated levels added periodically through 2008, Modus was one of the first Escape the Room games and has had a strong and enduring influence. Players moved through a series of rooms, clicking on screen elements to solve puzzles. As players progressed through the rooms, the plot of the game unfolded, with the player finding clues hinting to the fact that they may be, spoiler alert, a clone. Sadly, with the retirement of Adobe Flash, the game is no longer live on its original site, although apparently it can still be played via Flashpoint. Modus directly inspired what is perhaps the most iconic online escape room, and the one that has arguably had the most influence. 2004's Crimson Room, made by Japanese creator Toshimitsu Takagi. Like Motus, Crimson Room was also played via the now-defunct Adobe Flash, Crimson Room was so influential and popular that the word Takagism, after the game's creator Takagi,
became synonymous with escape rooms. When live escape rooms first began to open in Japan and other Asian countries, they were often referred to as Takagism. Clearly, the popularity of escape room video games has had considerable impact on the emergence of live escape rooms. You could even argue that escape rooms may never have existed without video games. But there are other media that also played a role in the emergence of escape rooms, particularly in Western culture. This includes the Western world's most powerful media vehicle, television and film. There are several movies and TV shows that have clearly influenced the escape room genre. And while we don't have time to discuss them all, we'll touch on some of the big ones. The Adventure Game was a television series that aired in the UK from 1980 to 1986. Episodes consisted of challenges that look almost identical to modern escape rooms, and, like modern escape rooms, the show had a narrative driving the puzzles. Three contestants would be stranded on a distant planet. In order to power up their spacecraft and escape, they had to find a magic crystal. To find this crystal, players had to navigate through a series of puzzles and physical challenges. The drawn-out scenes of contestants awkwardly working through puzzles must look similar to what game masters must observe in a live escape room. <clears throat> And like an escape room game master, cast members would offer clues if players were stumped by the puzzles. While there are dozens of game shows from the UK and US that include a combination of puzzles and physical challenges, the adventure game stands out as the one that is most similar in design and concept to the modern escape room. Dr. Nicholson's 2015 survey of escape room owners shows that Indiana Jones is an inspiration for many proprietors, and it's easy to see why. The combination of adventure, narrative, and puzzle solving in the Indiana Jones franchise practically begs the viewer to go find their own real-life adventure. Think of the Holy Grail puzzles in The Last Crusade as one example. Nicholson's survey results also indicate that horror movies like Saw and Cube have inspired escape room owners. While much darker and more grotesque than Indiana Jones, both films feature gruesome puzzles and challenges. These movies are especially influential for American escape rooms, which commonly employ horror themes, a trend that is not as popular in other parts of the world. A personal escape room precursor for me is Nickelodeon's Legends of the Hidden Temple, which first aired in September 1993. In the many articles I've read about escape room history, I was surprised that none of them mentioned the show. Legends of the Hidden Temple is probably my number one escape room precursor. I loved the show growing up, and escape rooms are probably the closest experience to the temple run that I'll ever g Oh, I'm sorry. For those who haven't seen the show, each episode consisted of several physical challenges, with teams of children competing against each other in multiple elimination rounds until one team was left to attempt the temple run. The temple was essentially a giant escape room complex, with multiple chambers, puzzles, physical challenges, and also really creepy half-naked dudes who rushed out of the shadows and stole coins. Peekaboo! Another show that came up in my research, the UK's Crystal Maze, reminded me a ton of the legends of the hidden temple. While I can't find anything online implying that the creators of legends were inspired by, or even aware of the Crystal Maze, the parallels are uncanny, so Crystal Maze also gets an honorable mention. Finally, there is a movie that absolutely must be included in escape room history, though it is rarely mentioned in online articles about the topic. That is, Disney's 1980 flop, Midnight Madness. Midnight Madness follows a group of college students as they race around Los Angeles competing in a game called the Great All-Nighter, a scavenger hunt filled with puzzles and clues. Midnight Madness was a commercial and critical failure. Still, the film left a legacy by inspiring some of the earliest and most influential live-action precursors to escape rooms, puzzle hunts. Puzzle hunts existed before Midnight Madness, of course, 
But it wasn't until the early 1980s, after the film's release, that the puzzle hunt craze began to take off at college campuses across the US. Throughout the 80s and beyond, puzzle-hungry students at institutions of higher learning organized their very own versions of Midnight Madness. The first, and perhaps most famous, collegiate puzzle hunt is MIT's Mystery Hunt, an event that still takes place each year. Created in 1981 by then-PhD student Brad Schaefer, the MIT Mystery Hunt is notoriously complex, lengthy, and difficult. Schaefer has stated that he thought up the idea of the mystery hunt while driving across the country with his girlfriend. While I cannot find any interview with Schaefer stating that he was inspired by Midnight Madness, it is interesting that the inaugural MIT mystery hunt was held less than a year after the film's release. Was Schaefer inspired by the film, or is this simply an instance of parallel thinking? It's difficult to know. There is, however, an early and very famous puzzle hunt that was confirmed to have been inspired by Midnight Madness. The Game, a puzzle hunt created in 1985 by then high school student Joe Belfiore. Belfiore and his friends created a race, much like that in Midnight Madness, in which teams would solve puzzles to find clues. These clues would point players towards their next puzzle location. The clues and challenges would usually be tied together with an underlying theme or narrative. Belfiore carried this event with him to Stanford University, where he called it the Bay Area Race Fantastique, or BARF, before smartly renaming it as The Game. Belfiore has explicitly said that he was inspired to create the game after watching Midnight Madness. But let's go down a rabbit hole for a second. Belfiore's game may have been inspired by Midnight Madness, but what is less well known is that Midnight Madness was inspired by a series of puzzle hunts in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Business executive and former graphic designer Donald Luskin created a series of puzzle hunts with his friend Patrick Carlyle. The events, which Luskin and Carlyle simply called The Game, were a largely underground affair, although they did become popular enough to gain some press in the LA Times. This article in the LA Times inspired the screenwriters of Midnight Madness to create their film. But wait, there's more. Luskin has said that he and Carlyle were inspired to make their puzzle hunts after watching a 1973 film called The Last of Sheila, which was written by Stephen Sondheim and Anthony Perkins. The film follows a group of friends who are invited to take part in a mysterious scavenger hunt on a millionaire's yacht. But it goes one step further. Sondheim and Perkins were inspired to write The Last of Sheila after creating their own puzzle hunts in the 1960s and 70s. It's a classic case of life imitating art, imitating life. Today, there are hundreds of puzzle hunts hosted by universities, corporations, and community clubs. These events are appealing to participants because they are immersive challenges that call on a player's problem-solving skills and ability to keep calm under the pressure of a time limit. Before the 2000s, competitive puzzle hunts were arguably the closest thing we had to live-action escape games. Arguably. Because there is another live-action activity that has had considerable influence over the escape room genre, one that often gets overlooked or even outright dismissed. LARPing. We all know LARPing, live-action role-playing. While LARPing may call to mind knights swinging swords, over the last 40 years, LARPs have expanded to include more diverse themes and activities than these stereotypes, although yes, these stereotypes are still pretty accurate. There is obvious overlap between LARPing and escape rooms. Both are simulations, both are narrative-driven, both tend to include game or dungeon masters who help marshal the game, and both strive for an intense sense of immersion. To the untrained LARPer, that's where the similarities end. But actually, LARPs have included spatially contained, puzzle-driven challenges that look like escape rooms for decades. One example is True Dungeon, an escape room-like experience that debuted in 2003 at Gen Con, one of the world's largest gaming conventions. Created by Jeff Martin, True Dungeon is a two-hour experience in which participants walk through a fake dungeon where they solve puzzles, fight monsters, and interact with their environment to find treasure. 
While this sounds in many respects like an escape room, it was not branded as such, and was more of an attempt to play Dungeons & Dragons live. True Dungeon was a huge success, and is still offered at gaming conventions today. Having debuted at the 2003 Gen Con, the first True Dungeon predates Kato's Kyoto Escape Room by four years. While not a LARP, another experience that predates Kato's Escape Room is Five Wits, created by Matthew Duplessis in 2003. Five Wits is an interactive adventure featuring puzzles and challenges set amongst a theme narrative such as The Lost Tomb or Deep Space. This sounds like an escape room, right? Well, no. In fact, Five Wits' website makes an earnest effort to explain that, while similar, their business is definitely not an escape room. Neither I nor the developers of these experiences claim that they were the original escape rooms, or that anyone stole their ideas. Rather, I think that both of these examples are the result of a cultural trend of the mid-2000s, which allowed live-action experiences to flourish. But before we get to that, one last word on LARPing. In his aforementioned 2016 paper, Dr. Scott Nicholson says, When I presented this idea of escape rooms as being part of live-action role-playing to online communities of owners and designers, many from North America were vocal in disagreement in connecting escape rooms to role-playing games. Owners believed it would hurt their business if potential visitors believed there would be role-playing involved. Part of this is cultural. LARP is not seen in a positive light in North America, but it is more openly accepted in European countries and is closely related to cosplay, which is accepted in Asian cultures. I found this interesting and wanted to comment on it. After researching this video, it is evident that LARPing and role-playing tabletop games have had a significant impact on escape rooms. In fact, many of the developers of the different media and experiences that I've talked about here were fans of Dungeons and & Dragons and or LARPing, and some developers even list these as direct inspiration for their own projects. For example, Patrick Dowling, the BBC producer who created the adventure game, was an outspoken Dungeons & Dragons fan, and he created the show specifically because he wanted to make a TV series that captured the mood of Dungeons & Dragons. And just listen to this interview excerpt from Rand Miller, co-creator of Myst. We drew on a bit of some stuff we had, uh, these ideas we, when we were younger, where we had played D&D. &D. And I remember early on playing D&D, &D, I was, you know, I was still, my, I, I, was, I was in my 20s, I wasn't that young, but playing D&D, &D, my first experience was somebody else leading me through a pre-existing dungeon and rolling the dice and, and blah, blah, blah. But it, it had this interesting feeling and it felt like I was solving things and it felt like I had to overcome something. And, but my first impression was, well, I don't want to play this again. I want to make this. I agree with Dr. Nicholson that there is a cultural stigma attached to LARPing, especially in the U.S. I've read a few articles and comments online from D&D players and LARPers who are frustrated that these hobbies are not given due credit for their impact on puzzles and gaming. Some even go so far as to say that any and every single form of puzzle or gaming that has emerged since the 70s, puzzle hunts, video games, ARGs, escape rooms, would not have existed without role-playing games. My own personal interest in escape rooms has nothing to do with LARPing, even though the medium has been influenced by LARPing to a large extent. And this cuts to the very core of why talking about the history of escape rooms is so difficult. There really isn't a clean answer as to their intellectual origin. Given that the first escape room was created in Japan, and that the creator specifically mentioned Escape the Room video games as his inspiration, I think Japanese video gaming is the closest we can get to an origin story. But even that answer isn't comprehensive enough. I can't speak to the influences of every single escape room developer, nor can I speak to each and every influence that drives players to escape rooms. Every person is interested in escape rooms for their own reasons, often because escape rooms bear resemblance to past events, puzzles, and games that are meaningful to the individual. This is why I have tried my best here to summarize broad categories of influence, instead of constructing a timeline in which Media A led to Media B led to escape rooms. The history is simply not that simple. 
Having debuted in the mid-2000s, escape rooms emerged amongst a broader trend of themed, live, interactive entertainment. Over the past couple of decades, consumers have become increasingly bored with passive forms of entertainment, in which they are expected to sit back and watch someone else have all the fun. Consumer research has shown that people aged 21 to 34 are more likely to spend disposable income on experiences than on goods. People want more interaction with their entertainment, and perhaps think of interaction in a more complex way than they did pre-digital media. Consumers want multi-sensory experiences that integrate digital activities with the real world. The overwhelming popularity of Pokemon Go is one testament to this trend. Theming is also important. Audiences have grown accustomed to highly curated content, goods, and events. We have come to expect a sort of algorithmic experience, one that is informed and shaped by our behavior and preferences. All of this is conducive to live, interactive, immersive entertainment, and it raises the question of whether and to what extent the digital world has impacted our desire and standards for such entertainment. One could argue that our increasing desire for interactive entertainment is a sort of backlash against digital media, a return to normal. But I think what we are seeing is a reconceptualization of what interactive entertainment means. The capacities of digital media have inspired us to be more innovative, creative, and expansive when designing experiences IRL. Many popular location-based experiences include or are centered around a digital component. For example, the highly popular Ice Cream Museum was clearly designed with Instagram and other social media in mind. Virtual reality, while still a gaming novelty, has become more widespread. Even escape rooms can have a digital component by using tablets or other technology within their rooms. We all want our reality to reflect our imagination, and digital media like movies and video games have helped us to do that. In this way, it seems like no coincidence that escape rooms emerged when they did. By uniting our universal love for problem solving, with the new and perhaps more fantastic standard of adventure. Escape rooms, whatever their true origin story, seem like an inevitability to this particular moment in time. <laughs>